Good morning to you and welcome to our online worship service as we gather together on this second Sunday of Lent. My name is Tom Ulrich and on behalf of our congregation here at New Covenant Community Church in Akron, I am honored and delighted that you are joining us for this time of worship together where we gather with our Lord who reveals kindness in every sorrow, who opens his arms to the outcast, and who guides our wayward steps toward the path of newness. On this second Sunday in the Lenten season, we will not only have the joy of sharing in this morning's liturgy and with Ken Heisman's leadership to sing some hymns, but we'll also have the joy of celebrating the sacrament of communion, as we will on each Sunday during Lent. And so you are encouraged to have a piece of bread and a cup of, of the juice of the earth available so that at the appropriate time we may partake together. But now let us gather before the one who calls us to follow his way, to live by his truth and rejoice in his gift of life. And let us share in our responsive call to worship, which is found in the bulletin that you received by email. During this season of Lent, let us follow the way of Christ. May we share God's steadfast love and service to our fellow human beings. In walking with Jesus, may we make new discoveries as we journey through the wilderness. Let us commit ourselves to faithful discipleship. In this time of self-examination, let us discern how God is working in us and through us. In our mission and ministry, let us worship our Lord who calls us to carry and lift high the cross. And let us sing together. and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. 
And so we can bring to God the darkness and sin that reside in the secret caverns of our hearts so that the light of God's grace can shine upon us to cleanse us of our sin, to redeem us from our past, and to renew us with love. Let us now lift our voices as we share in our unison prayer. And then following our corporate prayer, we will have a brief time of silence to offer our individual petitions to God. Let us pray together. Merciful Lord, although you shine your light upon our Lenten landscapes, we have often preferred to seek our own way in darkness. Because we are comfortable remaining in the shadows of worldly wisdom, we have neglected your teaching only to find out how foolish we really are. We have pretended to be thoughtful and altruistic, Yet in fact, we have sought nothing but self-interest. Have mercy upon us, Lord, and forgive our lack of trust in you. Break through our resistance and our fear with your illuminating love, so that we may respond to your call, live according to your word, and follow wherever you lead us. For we ask these things in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. If the Lord would mark iniquities, who could stand? But there is forgiveness with God, so that God would be revered. Friends, believe the good news of the gospel. Through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Amen.
scripture lesson this morning comes to us from the Gospel according to Mark, chapter 8, verses 27 to 38. Now virtually all readers of the Gospels recognize that the teachings of Jesus run counter to the values and philosophies of the world. In fact, the world most likely views the message of the Messiah as maladjusted to the moment, as so idealistic that it doesn't apply to reality. In today's reading, Jesus once again challenges his disciples to embrace a teaching that counters the world's emphasis on self-preservation by summoning his disciples to take up a cross and to discover life by relinquishing it. From Mark chapter 8, verses 27 to 38, this is the word of the Lord. Jesus went on with his disciples to the villages of Caesarea Philippi, and on the way he asked his disciples, Who do people say that I am? And they answered him, John the Baptist, and others, Elijah, and still others, one of the prophets. He asked them, But who do you say that I am? Peter answered him, You are the Messiah. And he sternly ordered them not to tell anyone about him. Then he began to teach them that the Son of Man must undergo great suffering and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, and be killed, and after three days rise again. He said all this quite openly. Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and looking at his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. He called the crowd with his disciples and said to them, If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it. And those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. For what will it profit them to gain the whole world and forfeit their life? Indeed, what can they give in return for their life? Those who are ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of them the Son of Man will also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. Friends, this is a word from the Lord for the people of God. Thanks be to God. One Sunday, as Methodist pastor Rob Lyle delivered a sermon on loving your enemies, he unfortunately encountered some resistance from the parishioners in his congregation. And one fellow, deep-throated and angry and loud, before storming out of the church, shouted at him, Are you crazy? You must be insane. What's wrong with you? Are you out of your mind? That afternoon, as the preacher sat with his wife and the district superintendent who had come to console him, Reverend Lyle reflected on how Jesus calls us to a lifestyle that is maladjusted to the world's ways. And he said, People don't want to be disturbed. They want assurance. They don't come to church on Sunday morning to think about new ideas or even the old important ones. They want to hear what they've always been told before with only some small variation on what they've heard, on what they've been hearing all their lives. And then they want to go home and eat pot roast and say it was a good service and feel satisfied. But in fact, Jesus does disturb, disturb us. And because Jesus disturbs us, many of us would prefer not to hear his statements that seem to be maladjusted to the world's formula for achieving success and prosperity. I mean, as if the command to love your enemies wasn't difficult enough. 
Jesus continued to add other maladjusted instructions, according to the world, for the people who say that they want to be his followers. Turn the other cheek. Give to everyone who begs from you. Practice unlimited forgiveness. And then this one. If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it. And those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save. It's virtually a miracle that Jesus got anyone to follow him. Because after, after all, carrying the cross means bearing the sometimes painful burdens of love and service and redemptive action undertaken for others. For carrying the cross is not some kind of magical ritual or religious cliché. On the contrary, carrying the cross demonstrates an alternative mode of living. Carrying the cross cuts through our conventional wisdom. It brushes aside popular piety, and it runs counter to our natural inclinations. As carrying the cross conveys the gospel at its most terse and dangerous articulation. The message from the Messiah is neither naive nor non-essential because Christ's words are not just religious teaching. They are proposals to consider how public policy secures the common welfare. They are claims that challenge us to consider how our lifestyles are contributing to climate change that bring health, that bring death rather than health and life. They are invitations to re-examine how greed infects our lives as well as our economic policies. Carrying the cross reveals that we know that there is more to life than just weekends and paychecks and quick thrills. And it calls us to turn away from self-centeredness in an effort to promote the kingdom of God. To deny ourselves and to carry the cross means participating in a new kind of world as a new kind of human being. For saying that we, by, that we are disciples of Jesus Christ means that we acknowledge his authority over our lives. And therefore, we live by his teachings, we walk in his way, and we share his love. But more often than not, it seems that we, like those first disciples, are unwilling to embrace the way of the cross. Even though Peter had heard Jesus say, Whoever wants to save his life will lose it. After Jesus was arrested in the garden, Peter would save himself by denying that he even knew Jesus. And in that garden of Gethsemane, all the other disciples also saved themselves by forsaking Jesus and fleeing for their lives. And even though Judas must have heard Jesus say, what does it profit a person to gain the whole world and lose one's own soul? For some extra cash in his pocket, Judas sells out the 30 pieces of silver. But my friends, there is a multitude of Christians who sell out for a lot less than that. A little compromise here to get us in with the right crowd. Rationalizing a particular kind of behavior there thinking ourselves to be too timid to stand up for the message of Christ. And we sell out. And when we do, we bow down to those false gods which seduce us with power and profit and public opinion. But to all of us, Jesus says, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up the cross, and follow me. Because believe it or not, that is the way to meaning and purpose in life. For Christ's apparent maladjustment of calling us to deny ourselves and carry our crosses stirs us out of a life centered on individualism and self-interest. And it immerses us into a life which is built on the message and ministry of Jesus. And if we profess that we are Christians, 
And if we say that we are followers of Jesus Christ, then we do not take up the sword and annihilate all enemies and opponents. On the contrary, we take up the cross and we follow the crucified Christ as people of hope because we know that in spite of the suffering that we may experience, the crucified one became the risen one. And it is in following his way that we discover expected hope and true abundant life. Indeed, this maladjusted paradox is profound. Those who want to save their lives will lose them, and those who are willing to lose their lives for Christ in the sake of the gospel will embark on a journey along the road of the cross that, while difficult and dangerous, will inevitably lead to life saturated with meaning and and if believers like Jesus have the courage to take up the cross and to lose one's life in challenging unjust structures and in confronting the world of the powerful, then perhaps it is the maladjusted who actually lead. Perhaps it is the maladjusted who create a new reality. Perhaps it is the maladjusted who change the world. 56 years ago, on February 26, 1965, Martin Luther King Jr. delivered a sermon at Temple Israel in Hollywood, California, at a time when our nation was marked by civil unrest. For just nine days after he spoke, approximately 200 Alabama state troopers would clash with 525 civil rights demonstrators in Selma, Alabama, on what became known as Blood A Sunday. And just 10 days after he spoke, about 3,500 U.S. Marines would arrive in South Vietnam, becoming the first American combat troops in that Southeastern Asian country. And in that context, in the course of his sermon, Martin Luther King Jr. spoke of maladjustment telling the congregation, I must honestly say to you tonight, my friends, that there are some things in our world, there are some things in our nation to which I'm proud to be maladjusted, to which I call upon all people of goodwill to be maladjusted until the good society is realized. I must honestly say to you that I never intend to adjust myself to segregation and discrimination I never intend to become adjusted to religious bigotry. I never intend to adjust myself to economic conditions that will take the necessities from the many to give luxuries to the few. I never intend to adjust myself to the madness of militarism and the self-defeating effects of physical violence. I'm about convinced now that there is a need for a new organization in the world the International Association for the Advancement of Creative Maladjustment. Men and women who will be as maladjusted as the prophet Amos, who in the midst of the injustices of his day would cry out in words that echo across the centuries, let justice roll down like the waters and righteousness like a mighty stream. As maladjusted as Abraham Lincoln, who had the vision to see that this nation could not survive half slave and half free. As maladjusted as Thomas Jefferson, who in the midst of an age of amaz amazingly adjusted to slavery, would etch across the pages of history words that have been lifted to cosmic proportions. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. As maladjusted as Jesus of Nazareth, who said to the men and women of his day, love your enemies, bless them that cur curse you, pray for them that despitefully use you. And through such maladjustment, we will be able to emerge from this bleak and desolate midnight of man's inhumanity to man into the bright and glittering daybreak of freedom and justice. Perhaps it is the maladjusted who lead. Perhaps it is the 
maladjusted who create a new reality. Perhaps it is the maladjusted who change the world. In the same way, Jesus Christ invites us, summons us, to a lifestyle of creative maladjustment. Not merely to endure the burdens of existence or the practice of an ascetic self-denial, but to take up the way of the cross that resists the forces of the world that try to overwhelm us. Jesus Christ invites us and summons us never to accept the impl implementation of violence or abuse, but to lose our lives in confronting the hostilities of hatred with the power of Christ's love. Jesus Christ invites us and summons us not to live our lives as if no one else matters, but to be willing to stand in solidarity with powerless victims of mistreatment and oppression. And then in our own maladjusted way, in Christ's maladjusted way, we will overcome the powers that seek to hold us captive. And we will instead participate with our Lord in fashioning a new future, in creating a new community, and in shaping a new humanity. And then together with Christ and with one another, we will discover that the way of discipleship is more fulfilling than we had ever imagined. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us pray. God of life and wonder, who looks not upon our failures, but upon our faith, who remembers not our misdeeds, but our discipleship, and who seeks not to condemn but to encourage. As we follow you on this Lenten journey, inspire us to forge new ways of living into your love, peace, and justice. Break down all the barriers which would hinder us from participating in your work that challenges the ways of the world. Bless us with the gifts of stamina, courage, and dedication so that we would not be talked out of our faith and enable us to relinquish the old habits of self-centeredness in order to live differently, to share generously, and to redefine our social reality according to your truth. Grant that our words would be shaped by your word. Refine every thought with the sweetness of your grace and inspire every deed through the power of your spirit so that our lives would demonstrate to the world how you are working in us. As you call us to deny ourselves and take up the cross to follow you, teach us to love the people we find it difficult to embrace. Strengthen us to resist the injustice that steals dignity. And give us the courage to risk ourselves to challenge violence, corruption, and abuse. Because many in our world are carrying the crosses of tragedy and suffering, we thank you that your healing hands seek to mend the brokenness of the world. And so we lift up in our prayers all those who are reeling from human tragedy, from disease, or from illness. And especially we pray for the global community as it grapples with this pandemic. For children and parents who are navigating school and work under stressful circumstances. And for those hurt by the snow and ice storms that have ravaged large sections of our country. May the power of your Holy Spirit bring new life and new hope to all people in hospital rooms or emergency rooms or waiting rooms or recovery rooms or just lonely rooms so that they may experience peace instead of pain, wholeness instead of heartache, and celebration instead of sickness. We also pray for nations, countries, and governments where tension and turmoil are present. Illumine the minds of all leaders with wisdom so that they would neither speak nor act thoughtlessly or in arrogance. And grant that their ideas would become a beacon of light to the world. As we pursue greater unity and peace in our community and across the globe, enable us to demonstrate your love, care, and respect for one another, and reveal to us the new reality that you are crafting among us, a reality where death does not have the last word, 
a reality where pride, selfishness, and evil are defeated by love and self-giving, a reality that does not parade itself for all to see, but fills every moment, every situation, and everything with life. Inspire us for your work and equip us to serve as channels for the true and abundant life that can be experienced through Jesus Christ our Lord, in whose name we pray and who taught his disciples when praying to say together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. The offerings we share enable us to serve as God's witnesses to the ends of the earth by utilizing our gifts and talents to serve God faithfully. At this time of pandemic, let us seek to honor God with our tithes and offerings trusting that God will work through them to enhance the quality of life for all people, and the church may always promote the dignity of God's grace. If you would like to send in a financial contribution to the church, we would humbly and gratefully receive it, and we would thank God for the gift, and we would thank God for you. Also, we are still encouraging all who are interested in filling buckets of care for our friends in Honduras. You can come by the church and pick up a bucket which has a label for all the items that are needed in the bucket. For the plates, for the spatula, cups, combs, towels, and sheets. After the bucket is full, our friends at the uh, Central American Medical Outreach will come by the church and pick them up and ship them down to Honduras. If you could, please have your buckets filled and back to the church by March 21st. Nevertheless, regardless of the way you share your gifts with our fellow human beings, may God bless you as you contribute your financial resources and your human resources to God's church, and to the world. May God bless you. seek to inhabit a universe of grace. 
For here at this table, we encounter the living Christ who welcomes us and heals us and befriends us. Here at this table, we are inspired for a new way of living with God and with our neighbors, both near and far. Here at this table, we are renewed to become one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to the world. Here at this table, there are no conditions for church membership, nor any requirements for theological belief. Here at this table, we share God's gift to us. So come. Come not because the church invites you, but because Christ invites you. And Christ's invitation is as open as his outstretched arms on the cross. Come from north and south and east and west and come and share the blessings that our Lord has prepared for us. Let us pray. Merciful God, whose forgiveness knows no bounds and who opens a new future to us, we thank you that as imperfect as we are, you nevertheless welcome us as sons and daughters to your table and nourish us to live with joy and anticipation in your coming reign in the world. Grant that these sacramental gifts would be so vibrant with life that we would convey to all the world a unity of spirit, our love for neighbors, our forgiveness of enemies, and the will to serve you every day. And grant us that we may share in the solidarity and peace of one faith, one hope, and one love as people redeemed and renewed by your Son. At this table, pour out your Spirit upon this feast and upon all of us who share it, and nourish us with your grace, so that through these sacramental elements set before us, we will be strengthened through the bread that is broken we, had been, we would re be renewed through your cup of grace and we would be enlivened with your love so that we may deny ourselves and serve our fellow human beings with your care. Sustain us by these gifts so that in this sharing we may come more fully to know you and become your committed servants everywhere in the world. For we ask these things in the name of Jesus Christ our Lord. The Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. After he gave him thanks, he broke it, saying, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, our Lord took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink from this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. Friends, these are the gifts of God for the people of God. And now, as Jesus was at table with his disciples, he took bread and he said to his disciples, Take and eat in remembrance of me. And after they had shared the bread, Jesus took the cup and again he said to his disciples, All of you drink of it. Let us pray. Life affirming God, may we who have shared in this feast of the new covenant know your love in our lives. Share your grace with all people and be a sign of your wholeness in the world. Having received the blessing of the bread and the cup, strengthen us for our Lenten journey through your inexhaustible love, with your peace that the world cannot give, in the joy of fellowship, among the splendors of creation, and for the mission of justice, so that in all that we do, we may live as your faithful disciples following the way of Jesus Christ our Lord, in whose name we pray. Amen. And now let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another with all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. 
And whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you and all those whom you love this day and forevermore.